Good morning, Calvary Chapel young people. How are you today? This is our second week in the study of Moses. Julia, what what are you going to share with us? Well, if you remember from last week's lesson, we learned about God's providence, what that meant, that God's plan or God's will. And we God has a plan for all of us, right? Absolutely. And last week we learned a little bit about the plan that God had for Moses. And so today we're going to see how God's plan for Moses evolves or changes as he grows to be an adult. We'll also see a, an important change in Moses in that he, he learns the value of God's heavenly treasures are so much greater than the value of earthly treasures. Because being the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he had everything he wanted. Lived in or a, at least everything he thought he wanted. He he probably lived in a castle. And like you said, anything that he asked for. He, Servants. Yep. The yep. best of foods, the yep. best of clothes, yep. the best of toys, whatever that was. The best video days. games, the best fishing rods, yeah. 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 I'm kind of kidding, but he really would have had the best of everything. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get started, would you lead us in prayer? Yes, I will. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for, again, being able to come together with our young people and share your word. It is so precious in our hearts to be able to meet, even though it's uh, through a video link, but we're able to share our love for our young children and our young adults in our church, Father, and we ask that you bless them. We ask that you give us the words of wisdom, Julia and I, to be able to share uh, your word with them at, and that they can comprehend what we're saying and that you would just prepare their hearts and mind and prepare our hearts and mind that as we come together uh, as a group, just to worship you and give praise to you and to learn about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, maybe surprisingly, our first reading comes from the New Testament. It comes from the book of Hebrews, which is often taught to be kind of a history of the saints that have come uh, before Jesus' time and before the time that this was written. And that would include people from the Old Testament. And so we're going to read a little bit from there. Yeah, a lot of Hebrews is, is talking about the real stellar Christians in the uh, Old Testament and in the young new church. So the believers in the Old Testament, do we think of them as Christian? Not so much as Christians, we think of them as Hebrews and God's people. God's people. And, and some of them were very important in the way that God revealed his plan for Jesus. Oh, yeah. It was, it was through the Old Testament saints that Christ came, came through that bloodline. That's and, true. The prophecy of Jesus throughout the Old Testament uh, was done through the Old Testament saints. So the Hebrew people played a pivotal role in the foretelling of Jesus Christ coming as we learn in the New Testament. So Hebrews eleven twenty four through 26. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So in his heart was, was what? I mean, here he is living a good life as a young lad uh, but something was tugging at his heartstrings something was tugging in his heartstrings he remembered the faith of when he was a young boy and the faith that he would have learned from the Jewish people in his community from his mother 
And that faith is what remained in his heart and tugged in his heart as he was becoming an adult and making decisions for himself. I got a question for all of us, for Julia and for all of you. Would you rather have everything you could ever want or total undeniable truth of who God is? Which would you rather have? So would I rather have all the books and clothes and sewing machines and toys and cars and vacations? Or would I, would I rather somehow get just total proof that God is real? Is that the question? That's the question. I really think that I would rather have the proof that God is real. I think it's something that takes a long time to learn um, we learn from Moses' example. He had everything that he could ever want or need. But in his heart, he knew that God was real, and he knew that he wasn't living a, a life that was honoring God. Yeah. And so it was that kind of faith and understanding in Moses, that understanding of, of right and wrong, that led him to God and led him to seek that truth. And I think that's that's what I would prefer to have too. So in his heart, he had undeniable truth of who God was. That's absolutely, he had it. He wasn't 100% sure about what all that meant. And so he sought God to find out. So he was able to easily turn his back. He, well, I don't know how easy it was, but he definitely turned his back for sure on the, on the life that he had lived in Pharaoh's. Pharaoh's it Pharaoh. may have been difficult, but it may not have been for it him. It may not, yeah, I don't know. But um, he did it. And he did it in such a way that he became the leader of the Hebrew people. Yes. God's anointed leader. So now we read, we go to Exodus. Now we're back in the Old Testament. And we're in chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 11. It says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, mm -hmm. one of his brethren. So he looked this way and he looked that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Well, this is surprising because we, we just learned that Moses left Pharaoh's house to seek God's will, and then he's in this situation. Well, maybe, maybe if, can you explain, starting with, what was it that the Egyptians forced the Hebrew people to do? Well, they forced them into slavery. They thought they could control them if they made slaves out of them. And, uh, and we remember from last week they were afraid that because they had so many children they were growing to be such a big nation they would overpower them. Okay, so they, right. they said, okay, you have to be slaves. And, and what, did, what did Moses do? Repeat that part again about what Moses did to the taskmaster, the Egyptian taskmaster. Well, what he did was he let his anger get the better of him and he killed the taskmaster. And he must have known he shouldn't have done it because it clearly says in the Bible he looked this way, then he looked that way, mm -hmm. then he killed him. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, since Moses was a Hebrew and obviously Pharaoh knew he was a Hebrew, uh, Pharaoh became very angry. And what we see is that if you allow your emotions to run away with you, especially in violent situations, if somebody's acting violently and you turn around and act more violently, you know, we're, we're just not helping the situation. We're not doing what really what God wants us to do, which is to show compassion and love, even in the most difficult of times. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so reading on, 
starting with verse 14. Then he, sa then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled in the face of the Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. So what did the, the Hebrew, I mean, have, how did he know what Moses did? Well, it, prob it doesn't say how he knew, but one of the Hebrew men knew that Moses had killed the taskmaster. In spite of Moses looking this way and that way to see if anybody was there, they knew. That kind of thing is something that people talk about. And somehow they knew. And um, so, so the result was that the people that he was trying to help came to see him as a hypocrite, saying, you guys should behave this way, and then Moses behaves a different way. So, so they're saying, you know, now when we argue with each other, you're going to kill us? So they, they lost confidence in him. They, they lost right. faith in him. And, and so what did uh, Pharaoh order to be done to Moses? And, and Moses Pharaoh was his stepson. Was his stepson? Was his... But he was a Hebrew. He was his grandson. No, he was a stepson. They, step you're right. Son. They adopted. So um, he, Pharaoh, who Moses would have considered to be his grandfather. Stepfather. Step-grandfather. Yeah, step-grandfather. So complicated. Right. It is. After Pharaoh learned what Moses had done, he ordered that Moses be killed. Um, and he did so. Moses had done something horrible. And the punishment that Pharaoh was metering out to him was also really horrible. And so, again, what, what Moses traded was wasn't as, as hard as a death sentence. He chose to live in the wilderness. He chose to leave Pharaoh and that family behind and live in the wilderness. It wasn't the easy, comfortable life that Moses was used to back in Egypt. So what Moses is having to learn and adjust. And now he's, he's learning that, Mo that Pharaoh once again wants him killed. So life is continuing to get complicated. Complicated. Yeah. Sounds complicated. So we continue on in Exodus six, uh, chapter two, sixteen and eighteen, and we read: Now the priest of Minia had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came, drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them, and watered their flock. They came to Raul their father and he said how is it that you've come so soon today well what what did they do for the women at the, that he met at the community well well you know Raul only had daughters obviously he had no sons he had seven daughters and the other shepherds were probably all men and they bullied the seven young women and we're going to take preference in watering their sheep over uh, Midian's sheep. And Moses put a stop to it. And then, not only did he stop it, he then helped the daughters, the seven daughters, uh, water the flock so they finished early and were able to come home early. Was Raul grateful? Oh, was he ever. He was so grateful that Moses had intervened in a positive way this time, not a negative mm, way. Good point. You know, he just prevented. He didn't get in a fight, but he stopped it. And then he assisted uh, with their sheep. But he was so grateful that he eventually, over a period of time, invited Moses to be part of their family and gave his oldest daughter to be uh, Moses' wife. That might sound strange to us because we kind of pick our own husbands and wives these days, but back then the, the back families then. chose for their daughters. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was important. It was, it was part of the way they lived. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, 
What what did Moses find in the land of Midian? Well, one, he found a wife. Mm -hmm. And we'll read more about her throughout the study of Moses. Uh, he also had a son. So uh, he got married. He had a child, a male child. But more importantly than just starting a family, he learned more about God and God's will for him in his life. Now, Moses is about 40 years old now. He's, he's not 15, 16. He's in his 40s. So there is periods of time that have taken place. Uh, and God has a plan for him. And that plan involves becoming the leader of the Hebrew nation. So why, why Moses was in the desert, he was able to learn a lot about God through uh, prayer. And as God spoke to him in that small, still voice that we hear in our heart every day, that's how he spoke to Moses. But later on, we'll see that he spoke to him in a more magnificent way. So living in the wilderness, it must have given him some time to kind of think and um, walk through some of the lessons that he had learned. It, it seems like humility. What is that? How does that apply to you? Teach him to be humble. To be humble of spirit and to put the other person first. And not being right doesn't mean you have to always insist on being right. So his his killing that taskmaster may have contributed not only to a sense that he was he was a man of strength and could do that, but also maybe recognizing that just because he could doesn't mean that he should. That's very true. And you know, we have to think we will learn what all happened to the Hebrew people, but it may have been different if, uh, if uh, Moses had not uh, acted in haste and killed an Egyptian. We don't know. That's just speculation. But what we do know is that we can make mistakes while we are trying to follow God's will. And even though we make a mistake, God can take us in our imperfect person and get uh, have his will be done. Just because we mess up doesn't mean God's plan gets messed up. God is able to take uh, those of us humans, and we're all imperfect, and work with us and accomplish his will. All we have to do this make ourselves available to God for that. So it seems like we've learned, once again, some very important lessons today. It, um, Rudy just said one of the first ones that we, we learned today, which was when we make mistakes, God can still use us to fulfill his will, that um, he, can, he can use the time and the lessons that we've learned to turn our hearts to him. Yeah. We also learned that when we're following God's path, we will increasingly come to feel like the heavenly rewards that God stores up for us while we're here on earth are more valuable than any of the earthly rewards we, we could ever find here. So simple things we learn those kinds of lessons. Uh, Maybe you have a treasured video game and it's one of a really, really important thing for you and you get a lot of joy out of it. It's not a bad thing, but when somebody comes over to visit with you, maybe it's a good thing to spend time with them rather than playing your video game. Or, or maybe that's a good time to share your video game with them. There's lots of ways that that we can decide that God's, God's treasures are more important than earthly treasures. And it doesn't mean that we have to throw all our toys away. But we have to figure out how we have those things and how we use those things in God's will. So that's the second lesson. And, and then the third lesson that we learned today is none of us is perfect. Do you know any perfect people? 
I've never met one. I've never met a perfect people. I never met a perfect person. Does God expect us to be perfect? No. No, he doesn't. He's a forgiving God. And he can use anyone, even people who have done some pretty bad things. He can use anyone to do good things if we are working, walking in his will. And sometimes if we're running away from his will, he can turn us and put us on the correct path and still use us. Yeah. And we will, as we study more in the Old Testament, we're going to study about some very, very strong saints who really didn't want to do what God wanted them to do. But through perseverance and God's gentle hand and guidance, they would come around and follow God's will. And great and mighty things happened throughout the Old Testament we read. And even in the New Testament we read where when God, all we have to do is think about Paul who we studied for several weeks. Mm -hmm. Turned him around. You know, instantly, you know, on the road to Damascus, uh, God appeared to him and said, Paul, why are you doing this? And there was an instant change. And Paul became one of the mighty saints of the New Testament. Indeed. Would you close in prayer for us? Yes. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this time we've had together. We hope that we've been able to um, share your word, uh, give our young people some insight into priorities and how you work in their lives uh, and just open their hearts that they will follow your leading and your direction and that as they do that they'll find that their life is a lot less complicated uh, than if they're trying to work outside your will. It won't be easy, there will be difficult times but when you are by their side or by our side, we know that all things will work to our good for those of us who are in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.